Okay, perfect. I think we'll get started. So I, I guess uh, I hope you guys are all on the same slide right now. Um, we ended off last time talking about the cruciate limit ligaments, so the ACL and the PCL. Uh, we talked about why we call them cruciates because cruciate uh, literally means um, things that cross over or cross shape. Um, and that kind of explains how the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments look in the knee. They cross over each other. Uh, we mentioned that the anterior cruciate ligament arises from the posterior lateral aspect of the distal femur and moves anteriorly to attach to the anterior part of the tibial plateau. Um, let me actually go back to that slide so it looks better. All right, so the anterior one we have over here in blue. So it, it starts off from that posterior, so back lateral, so outside of the aspect of that femur and moves anteriorly to attach to the anterior aspect of that tibial plateau. And it gets its name according to its tibial attachment, right? So anterior cruciate ligament because it attaches to the anterior part of the tibia. And then we have the posterior cruciate ligament, which about arrives from the posterior medial aspect of that femur and moves posteriorly to attach to the tibia, hence its name posterior. So we're gonna be talking about function. And um, I always like talking about function because it's, it kind of puts everything together, right? Mm -hmm. We have the structures, I could talk about anatomy all day, but to my, in my opinion, you cannot complete anatomy with, without talking about why we have certain things, right? So I kind of curated this slide to help you guys understand exactly why we have ligaments and how ligaments work in the human body. Um, we talked before that ligaments are more rope-like in structure, so they don't have much elastin, which makes it elastic, versus a tendon, which is more contractile and helps move things. Ligaments are trying to prevent things from moving too much, right? So tendons are trying to move things usually. Ligaments are usually trying to prevent things from moving too much. Um, so let's start with the anterior cruciate ligament, the ACL. Um, if you take a look at the diagram to the left, we're looking at the medial view of the leg. So we got the tibia at the bottom, the femur at the top, but then what you'll notice is we did a cross section of the femur. So we're looking at only half the femur. We did this so we can actually see the ACL because without removing that half or removing that, um, I call it a sagittal section of the femur, we wouldn't be able to see the ACL. So this is only half the femur and we're looking at the inside. And you can see the ACL over here, how it starts posteriorly on the femur, attaches anteriorly to the tibia. That's how you know it's the ACL. Now, um, if you look at these arrows, these are, these are forces that push the femur either posteriorly or the tibia anteriorly. Okay, so these are the two forces that will actually cause this ligament to uh, stretch into a tight position. Because of that, the ACL function, functions to limit the tibia's ability to move forward anteriorly to be displaced forward, specifically in an open kinetic chain. So if, you're if your foot, are, foot is not on the floor, we call that an open kinetic chain because you're not making contact with the floor. And if you were to just bring your tibia forward or hyperextend your shin, your tibia, you would cause this to stretch. And if this is stretching, it's because it's trying to stop that movement from happening even further, okay? Conversely, if you're standing on the floor, we're now in a closed kinetic chain, and the, tib the ACL, this ligament over here, now prevents the femur from moving posteriorly. Okay. Now I'm, gonna, I'm talking a little more slowly because it is a little tough to kind of conceptualize, but remember, if you were to bring the femur posteriorly, you could imagine this would get stretched. Um, on the flip side, the PCL would actually slacken because the PCL is the opposite direction, right? Now, on the flip side, we're gonna look at this diagram over here, which is the lateral view of that same leg. And same idea, we've cut half of that femur off, a sagittal cut. And that's just to help elucidate the PCL over here. 
Now, we also talked about how the PCL is a much stronger lig ligament, the ACL. We don't injure it as often. The PCL, I believe, is twice as thick as the ACL. So that's a big reason why um, it's a lot stronger, right? Thickness usually makes a huge difference. Um, and Mujad, no worries. I'm glad you could show up. Um, so we're looking at the right diagram. Now, the knee is a little bit bent, right? We talked about how the PCL actually stabilizes our knee more when our knee is bent. And so it does the opposite of the ACL. In this bed position, um, either forces that are pushing the femur anteriorly forward or forces that push the tibia posteriorly backwards, both of these forces are prevented from happening because the PCL gets tight, whereas the ACL slackens. Okay, I'll say that again. So if there are forces that bring the femur anteriorly, so forward, or forces that bring the tibia posteriorly backwards, the PCL gets tight to prevent any more movement from happening. It checks it. We call it, it, we call it a ligament checking a movement in the physiotherapy world. So this should give you kind of an idea of how the ligaments function. Um, clinically, what I do to test these ligaments is I do a, uh, a drawer test, and we have two forms of a drawer test. We have an anterior drawer test and a posterior drawer test. And what I'm doing is I'm either pulling the tibia anteriorly, if you look at this diagram over here, while my client is, let's say, on their back with their knee bent to see if there's any any movement that way, right? You don't want to see much movement anteriorly. I'm checking to see the integrity of the ACL. I'll also do a posterior drawer test. And we call it a drawer test because the way we pull on the tibia is like the way you would imagine pulling on a drawer, right? But I also do a posterior drawer test to check the integrity of your PCL, right? So I, I check how much movement I could get on the tibia posteriorly just to see the integrity of the PCL. And you, you'll, you'll notice a few things with those kind of tests. A, you'll notice there's a little bit more movement than usual, um, or B, there's too much. And you're, you're also looking for pain, right? So there's a partial tear, there might be a little bit of pain as well. There's a full tear, maybe not a lot of pain because the, the, the structure's already cut, or you're gonna get too much movement. Um, or it could be congenital too, right? So. Sometimes people can have a more loose ACL or PCL just naturally, and that's why we tend to test both the right side and the left side to, to kind of compare the two um, and to establish a baseline, right? Because sometimes people are just super flexible, right? Uh, women more common than men as well. Any questions so far about this slide? Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Ali, yeah. sorry, could you just review um, which way you're pushing to test the ACL versus the PCL? Yeah, for sure. So for an ACL, I'm actually pulling the tibia forward to mimic what would, you know, stress the ACL out, right? So if you look at the left diagram over here, we're looking at the medial view. Um, to the left of this diagram is the anterior aspect of the knee joint to the right of this diagram is a posterior aspect. So if I'm pulling that tibia anteriorly, I'm testing to see the integrity of the ACL. So I'm pulling this tibia forward versus the PCL. We do a posterior drawer test. I'm technically not pulling, I'm actually pushing. I'm pushing that tibia backwards to test the integrity of the PCL. So again, this is the anterior aspect of the knee on the right side of this diagram and the posterior aspect of the knee on the left side of this diagram. So hopefully that makes a little more sense. I mean, I could also show you guys a diagram of how that might look. Let's see. Yeah, so I, I hope you guys can see this. Um, you see a therapist apply pressure. What this therapist is doing is he's pulling that tibia towards himself in this diagram over here. 
and that's testing the integrity of that ACL. And then if he were to push it forward as opposed to pull it towards him, if he were to push it away, he's now more so testing the integrity of the PCL in that position. Okay. So let's talk about the tibial plateau. So what we've done is we've taken the femur out of the way and we're looking at a superior view of the shin, so the tibia. Um, the tibial plateau is what articulates with the femur through the femoral condyles like we talked about before. Um, this is just to give you an idea of you know, what those structures look like on that weight bearing. So we call it the weight bearing surface of the knee because all the weight that's transferred from your femur goes onto this surface. And we talked about how none of the weight goes onto the fibula, which is another shin bone. Okay. So my first question to you is that fibula, is it on the medial aspect or the lateral aspect of your shin? Where would we find that fibula? I'm going to wait for a couple more answers. Okay, so we have answers for both. So we're getting both medial and lateral. Um, it's actually the lateral aspect of your shin. So if you guys were to feel the outside of your shin right now, um, if you feel a very bony prominence, so if you go past your femur right now and go down inferiorly and you feel another bony prominence after you feel your knee joints, you'll feel the head of your fibula, actually. So your fibula is lateral. Alrighty. So let's talk about all the structures there. We have the tendon of the popliteus. We haven't really talked much about that muscle yet. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. So the tendon of the popliteus is right over here. But more importantly is, you'll see the patella anteriorly. So we know this is the anterior part of the joint and the posterior aspects over here. Um, patella is over here being the knee joint. Sorry guys, let me just turn off my phone. And in between we got that infrapatellar fat pad that we talked about last time, right? So. That's just there to create a little bit of space between the patella and the femur and the tibia, um, give a little bit of a cushion. Now, if you look a little bit more posteriorly, we start getting the meniscus of the human body. So a lot of you are aware of what the menisci are. We actually have two of them and they look like horns. Although if you look medially versus laterally, there are a few difference, a few differences, at least morphologically. Um, and there, the differences are there for a reason, right? So anytime you see a shape of a structure, it's shaped in a way that makes sense for the human body, right? Um, but first, let's just show you where the ACL and PCL are. So the ACL is over here in the blue. Again, attaching to the anterior aspect of the tibia. PCL attached to that uh, posterior aspect of the tibia and they're cut off. So you can't see the entire ligament just because we want to visualize what the menisci actually look like. Okay, so let's talk about meniscus uh, or menisci, menisci for plural. Meniscus, the meniscus is very important because it kind of cushions the knee joint. So you guys are aware of how both the top of the knee joint, which is the femur, and the bottom of the, the knee joint, which is the tibia, they both have their cartilage, right? Which lines the joint surface. And um, I think we, we, we mostly know about cartilage because when cartilage gets damaged, it leads to osteoarthritis, right? Degenerative change because of the two joint surfaces making contact with each other over time. Now the, menis the meniscus is there to prevent that from happening. Right, so it's a spacer of the knee joint. It creates a little bit of space between the two joint surfaces, at least on the outside. So you see it doesn't occupy the inside, but on the outside it's preventing, it's, pre, uh, it's creating a little bit of a cushion. Right, now the menisci function to help disperse the weight absorbed in the knee joint. 
um, as well as reduce friction during movement. So as you know, as we walk, the knee must go into knee bend and extension and all the weight of our body's going into this joint over here. Um, it creates a more frictionless surface, right? If, if there was more friction here, we'd, more, we'd, have, we'd be more likely to get inflammation, right? So swelling, degeneration, uh, redness, loss of function, pain, all those things associated with inflammation. So the menisci create a frictionless surface that helps the joints operate. So if the meniscus is worn down, um, yeah, indirectly it could lead to wearing and tearing of the patella. But remember, the patella articulates with the, with the femur at the, um, I cannot remember the name of that fossa. There's an indentation in the femur that the patella articulates with. So it's mostly articulating with the femur um, but just through wear, like wear and tear of the meniscus, you might want to put your weight somewhere else on the knee. Um, the patella might stop tracking properly because what happens with pain is we don't use our, the knee structures properly. So we're going to offload the weight to some extent, and that might cause poor tracking of your patella. So that could be a reason why, uh, the patella might wear down, but it's more of an indirect thing than a direct thing to answer that question. Hopefully that answers it. Um, now with see yeah so with the deteriorating patella i mean that's more so the articulation the patella has with the femur um it happens a lot in a condition known as patella femoral pain syndrome so i'll kind of type that in the chat so you guys can look that up patella femoral pain syndrome pfps um when you guys get a chance, Google it. I think it'd be interesting to help you understand how the patella works. Um, and it's actually more common in females. It's poor track of the patella. The patella actually starts migrating more laterally and it causes wear and tear between the patella and the femur. So it's something interesting to look into. All right. So for the menisci, the outer edges, so the outer aspect of both menisci are actually taller than the inner aspect. And because of that, it almost creates a wall that keeps the femur in place in the tibia, right? So the meniscus also has a stabilization function for the knee joint. Um, so a lot of different functions of the meniscus, I think it's really important to know is commonly injured um, when you get ACL tear, you're also pretty likely to tear your medial meniscus. They often go hand in hand. Um, now, let's look at both of them in isolation. So the, the medial meniscus, uh, from anterior to distal aspect, you can see it's a little bit wider. So it's larger in diameter. It has more of a C shape as a result. And this is because the medial condyle of the femur that attaches here is actually larger than the lateral condyle of the femur. So because of that, the medial meniscus had to have been built larger to accommodate that. Whereas the lateral meniscus is smaller in diameter, uh, looks more like an O, but you also see a consistent thickness throughout its entire perimeter. So the thickness over here, consistent with the thickness over here, consistent with the thickness over here. Whereas with the medial meniscus, pretty thin over here, a little bit thicker, super thick. And we call this the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And that also has a functional role to prevent any kind of slippage of the tibia anteriorly. So it almost acts the same way the ACL acts to protect the knee joint. It prevents that anterior translation or anterior movement of your tibia okay i know today we're getting a little more clinical with our anatomy but i thought i'd throw it in because it's a very 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 common place for injury especially in sports and then we got the coronary ligaments over here and you'll find them pretty much throughout but more densely in the posterior aspect of the menisci 
and they're just there to attach the meniscus to the perimeter of the tibia. So that's the meniscus. And the last slide for this lecture was a coronal section of the knee. And I've asked a trick question about this before. I'd ask you something like, are we looking at the right or the left knee? And the trick is that it's really hard to tell. It really depends on, you know, if we have any more information. You can't tell because it could be one or the other depending on how you're viewing it, right? So anytime you see a cross section, just be wary of the fact that it's hard to tell whether you're looking at the left or the right knee, right? Because they're both, they're, they're symmetrical to each other, right? And then depending on your perspective, if you're looking at the screen or behind the screen, it could change which, which view you're thinking about. So you can kind of see like the dense bony tissue over here. And then all the structures we've talked about, um, it kind of helps us understand their orientation, their relationship to each other. So in the red over here, we have the PCL. Blue over here, we have the ACL. Um, now, I want you guys to take a look at the menisci. So this kind of elucidates that the menisci are more on the outer edges, and they kind of look like a wedge. See that wedge kind of formation? And then inside over here, we see that the condyles of the femur, as well as the tibial plateau, are lined up with that nice hyaline cartilage, right? And there's that nice joint space in between the two surfaces, right? So this white over here is all that nice joint space. And the meniscus try to do their job to prevent these two joint surfaces from touching each other. But a healthy joint is a one where you have a decent amount of joint space, right? When you decrease in joint space, you increase the likelihood of these joint surfaces rubbing and degenerating each other which can lead to things like osteoarthritis later in life. All right, so we got the femur at top, we got the tibia on the bottom, we got the fibula over here. We know the fibula is on the lateral aspect of that shin. You can see the tib-fib joint, the superior tibi uh, tibia fibula joint over here. Let's look at another two structures. So we got the LCL and we got the MCL. Right, so the lateral collateral ligament on the lateral aspect of the knee and the medial collateral ligament on the medial aspect of the knee. Now, we, we talked about how the LCL is a pretty thin ropey ligament, hard to kind of tear. It's also a very external ligament. So it's originating from that lateral um, epicondyle of the femur and attaches to the fibular head over here. But you, you can kind of see it's, it's pretty external. Uh, it's easy to palpate on yourself as well. And it's there to prevent that varus stress to the knee that we talked about earlier in the lecture, right? Let me see if I can go back, actually. So if you look at this slide over here, when the knee goes into a varus position, so this middle diagram over here, you can see how the lateral aspect of the knee is starting to create space, it's almost starting to gap. And the LCL is preventing that. Whereas with the valgus stretch, the medial aspect of your knee is gapping which is stretching the MCL. And so the MCL is preventing that from happening. And so we see that in this diagram too. Right, the LCL is there, it's supposed to prevent the bare stress. MCL, the very thick ligament on the medial aspect of your knee is over here. Now the interesting thing about the MCL is that there really is no space between the MCL and the medial meniscus. They're kind of in close association with each other and they kind of hook together as a group. So what that means clinically is that when you hurt your MCL, you often hurt, hurt your me medial meniscus and vice versa due to their association and connection to each other. And then there's also an injury known as a terrible triad of the knee. I'll write that in the chat group right now because I didn't really... Let's see, terrible triad of the knee. Um, now people argue which structures are generally affected by this. Surgeons will say one thing, physiotherapists will say the other thing, but you'll get this injury where you get into a rotational valgus stress. So when you get into knock knee posture while playing sports, you'll hurt the ACL, your medial meniscus, 
and your MCL all at the same time. <laughs> so it's, it's a nightmare for recovery. Uh, you could imagine there's a lot of surgery that might be involved if you fully tear a lot of these structures. Um, but that's something that could potentially happen in a knee, especially when you get into that valgus and rotation of the knee beyond what the ligaments would support. Cool. Okay, so let's take a small little break. I'm gonna sit more on that T before it goes too cold. And we'll start with lecture number five. Any questions so far, by the way? If you do, just ask away. Yeah, for sure. So, um, are you are you talking about the terrible try of the knee? Those three structures. Okay, so terrible triad consists of the ACL, MCL, and the medial meniscus. So those three structures I typed in the chat are hurt with a valgus injury. So when your knee bends inwards, as well as your femur rotating internally, if you can visualize that. And it often happens happens in a closed kinetic chain. So you'll you'll often injure this while playing sports when your foot gets stuck to the floor. Um, happens a lot in soccer because the cleats getting stuck to the floor. Um, but it could happen in any sport as well. Like NFL, ha oh, sorry, NFL football, American football happens a lot. Um, basketball happens a lot as well. Any sport where you have a lot of like, you know grip to the floor it'll happen because the the foot stays planted but then your knee bends inwards and your femur rotates internally and because of that it nicks the acl the mcl and the medial meniscus all at the same time and they call it a ter terrible triad because it sucks to have three structures hurt from the same injury but it happens Yep, that would really suck. I wouldn't wish that on my enemies. All right, let's get into lecture number five. It's pretty painful, Majad. I've seen it quite a few times. Okay, so let's talk about the popliteal fossa. So anytime you guys hear the popliteal region or popliteal fossa, just remember, we, we already talked about what fossa is. Fossa is in like an indentation into something, right? We saw that in the scapula, right? When we had the supraspinous fossa and the infraspinous fossa, those indentations into the shoulder blade. Uh, we see it other parts of the body too, and we're seeing it now in the knee. But we're talking about the soft tissue now. So Fossa, indentation, popliteal. Popliteal region is the back of the knee. So we'll talk about all the structures in there and we'll talk about why they're important. But let's talk about kind of all the structures that we see in the back of the knee, just as a review. So on the medial aspect of the leg, actually, let me ask a question. I always like to ask orientation questions. Which leg are we looking at, the right or the left? This one's pretty easy, actually. Yeah, okay, you guys got it already. <laughs> That's pretty easy. So we can tell it's the right leg because we're looking at the posterior aspect and I guess we kind of assume that these were the small toes. But let's say you couldn't see the toes. How else would you tell? How else would you tell we're looking at the right leg if you couldn't see the toes at all? If the toes were right in front of you, they're being hidden by the heel. What would you, what would you say? Why the calf? What about the calf, you guys think? Yeah, I mean, the shape of the calf might help. Um, I guess more so what I'm looking for, yes. Perfect, perfect, yeah. So the calf, yeah, if you know that this is the medial gastrox, then you know that 
this should be the right leg because this wouldn't be the medial gastrox on the left leg. Sciatic placement. Um, yeah, um, the only thing with the sciatic nerve is that it's more medial throughout the leg, but then it has its branches that we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, position of the semimembranosus tendinosus, perfect, yes. So I, I like that one because we know that the semimembranosus and tendinosus are both hamstring muscles that are on the medial side of the thigh. So we know if this is the medial side, we know that we're looking at the right leg if it's the posterior aspect. Perfect. Okay, so let's, talk, let's start at the top left of the diagram. We got the semitendinosus, which is shaded a bit green, which is the most superficial hamstring muscle on the medial side. And underneath it, we got the semimembranosus. But the semimembranosus is the one that makes the superior medial border of the popliteal fossa, which is this diamond-shaped structure over here. Okay. Now on the superior lateral border, we have the biceps femoris. And if you guys remember, we have two heads to the biceps femoris. Um, those are the lateral hamstrings. Now on the inferior medial aspects and inferior lateral aspects, we got the two heads of the gastrocnemius. So we got the medial head and the lateral head creating the bottom two borders of the popliteal fossa. So another question here is, what are two functions of the hamstrings that we've talked about? What are two things the hamstrings do? Movements, movement wise. Flexion is correct, but I want more specific though. Perfect. Yeah. So you guys are on point. You guys, Mia, Penny, Sarah, you guys all got it. So um, extension of the hip as well as flexion of the knee. Perfect. Now, do you guys remember which one of the hamstring muscles do not extend the hip? So we got four of them. Which one doesn't extend the hip? I know I'm asking a lot of questions today. But I promise you, you'll never forget it once you answer the question. At least I never forgot it. Which one of the four hamstring muscles? So we got the semimembranosus, semitendinosus, we got the, the long head of the biceps femoris, and we got the short head of the biceps femoris. And just as I'm saying the names, we already got one answer. Does everyone agree? Tara with the <laughs> with the acronym, I love it. BF short. You gotta be careful though. I used to use BF a lot for blood flow, but I'll take BF too. We agree with uh, Tara always, awesome. And Arjena agrees as well. Okay, cool. So, yeah, it's the <laughs> it's the short head of the biceps femoris. All right. So, looking at the other structures over here, we all, we obviously got our um, vascular structures. So we got the popliteal vein and artery in the back of the knee. Um, now, the small saphenous vein is this blue structure, which originates from the foot and kind of empties into that popliteal vein at the popliteal fossa over here. Um, what else? We have the sural nerve, which is the branch of the sciatic nerve. So we talk about the sciatic nerve being a big nerve with uh, two separate nerves that come out of it, the tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve. Uh, the sural nerve is actually a really small branch of those two main nerves that exit out of the popliteal fossa and innervate the skin of the posterior leg including the lateral aspect of the posterior leg. Um, and you'll get a little bit of the lateral foot and lateral toe as well. So that's what we're seeing with the sural nerve, which is a branch of that sciatic nerve again. 
And then on the bottom, I didn't really label it, but we got the calcaneus. And that's that heel bone over here. That's where that Achilles tendon attaches to. So one mistake I probably made was I, I was going to leave osteology of the foot until we got to the foot lectures, but we might have to go through a bit of osteology today. Um, and then we'll get into more detail about osteology in our next lecture on Tuesday about the foot. And sorry, just in case no one saw the announcement, I won't be doing Thursday this week just because I'm a little bit busy with the movement all. But uh, the next lecture will be next week, uh, Tuesday. So this Thursday, uh, lectures canceled, just a bit busy with moving stuff around. And then Tuesday of next week is when we get into the foot. And that's where I'll talk about the osteology of the foot. So um, just bear with me for now about foot osteology. But this is the calcaneus. It's just another way of saying the heel. Thank you, Mia. We're gonna make it as happy as possible. All right, moving on. So let's look at the popliteal fossa in a more diagrammatic fashion. Um, again, we have the four separate borders over here. So we have semimembranosus, we got biceps femoris, we got the lateral and the medial gastrocnemius. Um, we got all the contents in there. So we got the popliteal artery, which is deeper. Remember, the arteries tend to be deeper because if you nick them, that's not good. They're highly pressured systems. You nick that, you're going to lose a lot of blood. Popliteal vein, pretty superficial. Um, this is where that short saphenous vein drains into. Um, we got that big sciatic nerve that, that originates from the lumbosacral plexus, the biggest nerve to come out of it. And we got the two branches of the sciatic nerve out of its epineurium. Epineurium is that covering of the nerve. So we got the common fibular peroneal slash peroneal nerve. And the reason why I have both names is they're synonymous. So fibular and peroneal, think of them as the same thing. Um, sometimes in anatomy, we have a problem of things having two names. And so you use whatever you prefer. I used to like fibular until I really liked peroneal. And I'm not sure why I like saying peroneal more, more now. It's just, I don't know. Does it rhyme with cereal? Is that why I like peroneal? I don't know. I like peroneal. Uh, but you can call it either or. Um, so the peroneal nerve exit off, exits off the sciatic nerve laterally. And we'll talk about how it innervates the more lateral um, leg structures. Whereas the tibial nerve comes off posteriorly and it innervates more the posterior calf structures. And then we already talked about that sural nerve being very superior, uh, sorry, very superficial, and it's just a sensory nerve. So it only gets sensation from the skin of the calf. Okay. So let's look at the osteology of the shin once more. Um, just to kind of orient you guys, it's a very childish diagram, but Sometimes I like to label things with color just to kind of elucidate things a little bit more. Um, this compass over here is just to orient yourself. So superior is the top, laterals to the left, medials to the right in this diagram. So we got the femur at the top. The patella is not a circle. And that's what pisses me off about this. I realized that too late when I sent you like you guys this slide. The patella is actually an upside down triangle. So the top of the patella is wide, the bottom is actually short. So think of a patella as an upside down triangle. So remove this from your memory that it's a circle. It's definitely not a circle. Um, we got the LCL, MCL, two collateral ligaments. And then we got the tibia articulating with the femur. Um, but this is more so just to show you the different parts or the different joints between the fibula and tibia. So the superior aspect over here at the top, the tibia is joined with the fibula through the superior tibial fibular joint. So that's in the blue over here. The middle aspect between the fibula and the tibia is joined by the interosseous membrane. That's that very um, tough fascia-like tissue that kind of connects the fibula to the tibia and spans the entire long bone over here. And at the bottom, the inferior aspect of the tibia and the fibula, we got the inferior tibial fibular joint, and that's here in the red. And then you see that on the bottom over here, the tibia and the fibula articulate with the talus, which is the topmost bone of the foot.
Okay, let's look at the fascial compartments of the shank or leg. Um, shank, I guess, because it's an easy way to memorize that we're looking at the leg. We're looking at a cross section. So if you look at the diagram to the left, this is where we took that cross section from. And so let's orient ourselves a bit. Um, we'll use this compass over here again. So anterior would be the front. Medial is the right of the diagram. Lateral is the left. And so we have all these different structures over here. So starting with the most superficial, we got in the purple, which is the skin. If you go a little bit deeper, we got that superficial fascia, the fascia latte. And it kind of encircles the entire shin. And then you got the deep crew roll fascia. So that's a typo there, guys. So you're actually going to type that C-R-U-R-A-L. So I'll type that out for you too. It's crew roll fascia. Okay. And those are kind of like deep invaginations of the superficial fascia into the separate compartments here. So that yellow actually kind of turns into that green and kind of goes in to create the different compartments of the, um, the calf region, right? So, and then we got the interosseous membrane. So if you guys remember from the previous slide, the interosseous membrane is what connects the long bone aspect of the, uh, the tibia to the fibula. So let's just go up one slide. So what we see here in the green or that lime green is the same structure in the red over here, except now we're just looking at a cross section. Okay. Um, and then just to orient, our, orient ourselves a little more, uh, the tibia is actually the front of our shin. And that's that bony layer that you can kind of feel. Um, there's no muscle in front of it, right? You only got the skin and the superficial fascia. So you can imagine if you kick with your shin, it's probably going to hurt really bad. Or if you bump into your shin, it hurts a lot. Um, unless you're a conditioned kickboxer or someone that kicks frequently for a living, um, that's going to hurt a lot. Now, the reason why you can condition your shin is that over time, when you repeatedly hit your shin, your bone accommodates to lay down more hard callus bones. So your bone actually gets more dense. Plus you lose a lot of the sensory nerves in the front of your shin. So you therefore cannot feel as much pain when you, when you kick a lot with your shin. But if you don't and you hit your shin, it's gonna hurt a lot. So that's that bony aspect of our shin right over here. So you can see all the different compartments. We've got the anterior compartment, which we're gonna talk about later on. I think the next lecture. Lateral compartment, we're gonna talk about a little bit later on today. And then we got the superficial post here, which is what we just talked about. So that's the gastrocnemius. Um, we're gonna talk about a few more in the superficial posterior compartment of the leg. And then we got the deep posterior compartment, which we'll hopefully also talk about today as well. We'll see how much time we have. And we got the fibula over here. Um, so there, these are all the different compartments. Um, one question for you, I guess, and I want to pick your guys' brains. Why, why might fascia become important clinically? So how can fascia become a problem? Is, is anyone kind of aware of what can happen with fascia in, especially the shin area? So fascia is a very dense tissue, right? That wraps these muscles into groups that you can kind of see in a cross-sectional view. Um, and they group them together, right? So superficial posterior compartment, we have a few muscles. We have a few muscles in the deep posterior compartment, a, a couple in the lateral. Anterior, we have a couple as well. So why, when can fascia become a problem? It doesn't stretch, so it's always there. And you got it, compartment syndrome. Has anyone heard of compartment syndrome? So Sarah knows what it is. Um, Anyone else kind of heard of compartment syndrome before or? Okay, no worries. Um, kind of wanted to talk a bit about it today. So compartment syndrome is basically a problem of the fascia. Now we know that fascia is not stretchy at all. It's not elastic. It's not like a tendon. It's more like a ligament when it comes to how much you can stretch it. You can't stretch it, right? It's there to kind of group everything in place. Um, Compartment syndrome is when we get inflammation in one of these compartments 
Now, what is a problem of inflammation? So if we have inflammation, let's say the anterior compartment here, what are one of the symptoms that might be a problem? What are one of the symptoms of inflammation that might be a problem in a compartment where you don't get much stretching at the borders? I'm really going to pick your guys' brains today. Now, you, now that you guys are so much smarter, so I have to pick your brains more now. What could be a problem? What's, what's one symptom of inflammation that could be a huge problem for a compartment that's limited in its space? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. You guys are getting it. So we're getting no room to swell, limited movement, tightness, swelling, swelling. You guys are all getting it. I'm so proud of you guys. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm really happy. Okay, so swelling is a problem. So when you have swelling um, in one of these compartments, if the fascia doesn't stretch, stress, you're going to get a lot of mechanical pressure. So this, the swelling is going to cause a lot of pressure in the soft tissue. Now, compartment syndrome happens primarily in the anterior compartment and is synonymous with shin splints. So shin splints can actually be caused by compartment syndrome as well. Okay. Um, it's not the only cause of shin splints. It's not even the most common cause, but it could be one of the causes. So it's a pressure pain. It's when that swelling is causing all the internal structures, soft tissue to be pressed up against the fascia that has no give. Um, now, we know that the muscles tend to have a lot of blood flow to them. So they'll have a lot of the vascular structures like arteries and veins. When you have that mechanical pressure, over time, what's going to happen is you're going to restrict the blood flow to a region of your calf, right? Um, compartment syndrome is more problematic when you have to use the muscle and you need that more blood flow, but then it tends to swell up because you need more blood flow. Um, so you'll notice it, especially with jogging and running. Now, um, to differentiate the diagnosis between a compartment syndrome and let's say another cause of shin splints, which is tibialis posterior um, tendonitis um, or medial stress fracture syndrome. Um, compartment syndrome is something that you get symptoms the moment you start running when you actually use that muscle and it swells or if you hit that muscle and starts swelling, but it'll go away the moment the swelling goes away. Whereas, you know, another cause of shin splint the, the, the pain might last even after activity. Um, so there are, different, uh, there are different ways to kind of diagnose, and that's kind of to give you an idea of the way I think when I look at different kinds of um, issues of the shin. Um, but in any case, when compartment syndrome gets really bad, what you might actually have to need is a surgical intervention to kind of nick one of those fascia layers, right? So if if the swelling continues or if there's just too much mechanical pressure in that anterior compartment, which is the most common place to get compartment syndrome, what the surgeon might have to do is actually cut the fascial layer over here to help release the pressure, uh, release the pressure. Okay, so just something to consider. And that's, I guess, our little dose of um, clinical application of uh, anatomy for today. All right, let's see, we got about seven minutes. Let me just see how we're doing on slides. Ooh, that's a heavy slide. I think I'll stop at that slide. And then, we'll, so we'll make the ankle movements the last slide for today because it's a pretty heavy slide. It takes a lot of explanation. And then next lecture on Tuesday, so next week, Tuesday, we'll, we'll begin at blood supply. So let's finish off with ankle movements. So ankle movements are probably the most complicated movements we have in the human body right? Because uh, so many different things are happening at different joints, but we only see what happens at the foot. But really, there are so many joints in the foot. And that's why it may have been important for me to teach you guys osteology first. So I could actually explain what all these bones are. Hmm. Let me think about this, actually. You know what? Scrap that. I'm going to leave ankle movements for the next lecture. So I could teach you the osteology of the foot first. Let's end off with the posterior leg, the superficial group. How about that? And then next lecture, we'll start off with the ankle movements. And that way, at least I can start you off with osteology first before I explain the movements of the foot.
Okay, so let's skip a couple of slides and finish off the posterior leg, the, super, the superficial group. So we're talking about this compartment of the calf right now, the superficial posterior, okay? So we already talked about the medial gastrocnemius and the lateral gastrocnemius, which is MG and LG for short, on the superficial aspect of that superficial group. If you move those two out of the way, you start getting into the deeper aspects of the superficial group. Um, but let's start with the gastrocnemius first. So if you look at the very top over here, you can see that it originates from the medial and the lateral condyles of the femur posteriorly. And the muscle is very bulky, has the two heads, continues into this tendon called the Achilles tendon and attaches to the calcaneus. So the Achilles tendon is pretty much the unity of three different tendons into one, or three different muscles into one, sorry. Um, very strong muscle of the ankle, and it is a plantar flexor of the foot. So I'll just use this diagram to uh, explain what plantar flexion is. So if you look over here, this is plantar flexion of foot, um, getting that foot to move downwards. Right? When the gastrox, the gastrocnemius contracts, it causes this movement to happen, plantar flexion, foot moving downwards. And the same thing applies for these other muscles. So the plantaris is a very small one that originates on the lateral aspect of that femoral condyle. And it actually crosses the posterior knee obliquely. So it starts laterally and it crosses towards the medial side, um, which is why I'm kind of confused that they didn't call it the plantaris cruciate muscle because cruciate would have been the perfect name for that. Uh, but in any case, it's a small and a weak plantar flexor as well as a knee flexor of the knee. Uh, sorry, uh, a flexor of the knee. So what I forgot to mention about the gastrox is that because it crosses the knee joint as well as the ankle joint, the calves or the gastrox actually causes knee flexion. So the gastrox is a two joint muscle as well. So sorry, I forgot to mention that. So the gastrox will cause plantar flexion, but it will also cause knee flexion, so bending of the knee. Same thing applies for plantaris because it crosses the knee as well as the ankle to attach to the medial aspect of the Achilles tendon. And you can see the, the plantaris having a very long tendon, one of the longest tendons in the human body. Now you must think, man, it's a pretty useless muscle if you have these big calf muscles over here. And I used to think that. But then when I learned more about the plantaris, it has a lot of what we call muscle spindles. So I'll kind of put that in the chat if you guys are more interested in looking into the details of what muscle spindles are. Um, they help with proprioception. The body's awareness of where its limbs are in space without needing visually see your limb. Wow, that's a mouthful. So if you guys get a chance, uh, try to Google muscle spindles. Um, the plantaris has a lot of them in them. So the plantaris is not so much there to plantar flex the ankle or flex your knee. It's more so there to help with proprioception. So helping the shin and the knee to understand where it is in space at all times without to actually without having to actually think about it. Um, I'll give you an example of proprioception too. Um, so what I want you guys to do is, and make sure that you're perfectly capable of doing this, close your eyes. Everyone just stop typing, close your eyes. Now take your dominant index finger, and while closing your eyes, touch the front of your nose. Everyone's able to do that, but you didn't have to look at your finger to do that. You are aware of where your body was in space because of structures like muscle spindles in our muscles, um, helping us know where we are in space without us having to actually look at our finger. That's proprioception. 
So a plant terrace, yeah, weak plantar flexor, weak knee flexor, but it helps us with our body's proprioception. Our joints have a lot of proprioceptors as well. So within the joints themselves, we have a lot of proprioceptors. Okay, and last but not least, we got the soleus muscle. That's that big boy over here. Um, you'll notice that the soleus doesn't, no, come on, Arjena. Okay, you're just joking. I didn't see that part. <laughs> Alrighty, so um, then we got the soleus muscle, which doesn't cross the knee, so it doesn't flex the knee. It originates from what we call the soleal line on the posterior tibia. So if you remember, if you remember from the osteology of the shin, there was a line we called the soleal line, and that's where the soleus attaches to. And it only crosses the ankle, but it's, it's again, it continuous with that Achilles tendon. So it's a very strong plantar flexor of the knee. Oh, sorry, plantar flexor of the ankle. So it does this movement. So it takes that foot and brings it downwards. And a lot of the time, so let's go back to the bodybuilding world for a second. Uh, when a bodybuilder wants to work his soleus more in isolation than, than his gastrox, what the bodybuilder will do is he'll sit down with his knees bent and do calf races instead of standing up while doing calf races. Because when you sit down while doing calf raises, you actually slacken your gastrox, right? Because it's stretched by knee extension. Whereas the soleus doesn't get involved in knee extension. So that's how they target their soleus muscle more. And then when they want to target their gastrox more, they'll stand up with a straight knee and do their calf raises. Okay. So, and just at, I guess at the bottom over here, triceps surrey. Um, that's just the combination of the medial gastro, the gastronemius, the lateral gastronemius, and the soleus. They all kind of merge into the Achilles tendon. That's why when you tell me triceps, guys, you got to be more specific. I don't know that you're talking about the triceps in your arm until you tell me break eye, triceps, break eye. And last but not least, the Achilles tendon is the strongest tendon of the human body. And you can imagine why because most of the human body's weight is going onto the ankle over here. It's also where we do a lot of our propulsion when we walk, run, or jog. So we often see a lot of injuries here as a result. Okay, so we'll end off there. What we'll do is we'll start with ankle movements next time, but I'll introduce foot osteology first. And then I believe the next lecture is probably going to be the anterior compartment. Let's see. I haven't really finished it yet. Um, yeah, we're going to start getting to the anterior leg and the knee. Sorry, anterior leg and the ankle. So that will be for next lecture. Um, in the meantime, if you guys have any questions at all, just ask me. I'm available to answer any questions for the next five to 10 minutes. Otherwise, have an awesome week.